Before we go and give credit for the 2017 NBA All-Stars, we have to enshrine the 2016 Role Player All-Stars into the Role Player All-Star Hall of Fame, I guess. I probably should have thought of a more official name, but eh, what are you going to do? Alan Crabb was my choice for shooting guards last season. I kind of disagree with myself looking back on it. Crabb's a good shooter, but I think there are other guys at that position who do more, but I still picked him. Point guard was George Hill. This is not going to help the uh, joke that I talk about George Hill in every video, but I mentioned him last year, so I'm going to have to mention him again. So, of course, none of these guys are going to be named in this video here, but so people don't yell at me in case I don't have one of these guys in the video. This is the reason why. Uh, Marvin Williams of the Charlotte Hornets. For the longest time, I thought the dude was one of the more boring NBA players, and he became a small ball four, and now I love the guy. Uh, Steven Adams for the center position plays a very thankless role with the Thunder, except everyone realizes how valuable he is, so it actually isn't that thankless. Um, so he's got that going for him at least. And then if we wait about four more seconds for him to get finished, uh, the other guy was my favorite player in the NBA, Andre Iguodala, for his defense, his playmaking, and... If I was an NBA player, I would basically want to be Iguodala. Respected by everyone in the league, make a whole bunch of money, but not big enough to where I'm a star player, so where I can still have some sort of privacy. Anyway, let's get to the new guys. Now first, we gotta do some backups. Or, I'm gonna name the backup, and then I'll name the starter. For the point guard position, the backup is TJ McConnell. His playmaking was really strong for the Philadelphia 76ers this season, and when they went on that run where everyone was healthy... Um, McConnell was the dude making a lot of really good passes, so shout out to him. But we have to go with a guy who I've talked about like two weeks ago or something, Patrick Beverly. The dude is, I don't know, one of the more fearless NBA players, I would say, because he'll be defending Steph Curry or Russell Westbrook or whoever the hell else, and he just seems unfazed. He actually embraces the challenge of defending these guys, and he actually does a pretty okay job at it as well. He also makes James Harden's day better. You should give him a cookie just for that one, because Harden's able to oftentimes defend the worst perimeter player on the other team, because he's got Beverly as well as uh, Ariza to help him out. Of course, he's not going to have Beverly anymore, but CP3 should help him out there. And then offensively, it helped out James Harden a lot as well, because Harden can just do his thing, you know? have the ball in his hand all the time, have people call him a point guard, which he basically was a point guard this season, even though I would still refer to him as a shooting guard, mainly because of who he defended. Um, and then Beverly could just do all the dirty work. That really helped Houston out. I think if Beverly wasn't there for them this season, like if he just wasn't on the team, like I don't know if their win record would have just drastically decreased, but I, I don't think... They wouldn't have fit as well with it as a team, is the best way to put it, because the defense-first, three-point shooting point guard who just kind of plays off ball, it's such an awesome thing for a guy like Harden, also for a guy like Eric Gordon as well, because Beverly and Gordon, uh, they would share some minutes together, so Beverly, he just fit in so well uh, with them, and shout out to him, he's the, uh, the point guard of the role player All-Stars of 2017. Now, the shooting guard, the backup, it kills me to not start Courtney Lee for two years in a row, but I can't start Courtney Lee for two years in a row. So he's going to be the backup for this one. He could get it next year if he's able to maintain his efficiency, three-point shooting, and still pretty good defense. But Tony Snell's got this one, man. I remember when Tony Snell, I think he was like a throw-in in a, in a trade or something to Milwaukee from Chicago. It was the Michael Carter-Williams trade. And I don't think anyone really thought much of it. And then Snell comes out, and I mean, he could already play defense, but his three-point shot was insane this season. I mean, when you look at his percentage, which was over 40%, on top of the amount of attempts that he had a game, the dude had like a Kyle Korver-esque three-point season. And if he maintains this for a long stretch, which is difficult to do, he could be thought of as one of the most efficient NBA shooters ever. And when you have a guy like Giannis who's making plays for everybody, having a dude who can shoot as well as Snell can, that's an awesome thing to have. Uh, Giannis 
he wasn't the only ball handler of this team. There was also um, Malcolm Brogdon, a rookie, who I guess I could have considered for the point guard spot for this as well. But I don't know. I didn't. So we got that going for us. So when you have Brogdon making plays, you got Giannis making plays, and you got a guy in Tony Snell who's just going to knock down a million three-pointers, it's great. He's not like going to attack the rim all the time, but if you get him on a cut, if you get him in transition, he's good from there as well. Just the type of dude who can just get out of the way a lot of the times offensively, but then when you call upon him, he can still do good things. And then the defense was still there, you know? So Snell, he already had the defense in Chicago, but... Really, that three-point shot coming alive is why I would put him here. And the contract that Milwaukee gave him this offseason, what was it, four years, $44 million? I think that's about right in line for who I would consider to be one of the best role players in the NBA this previous season, which is why Tony Snell is going to be here. Shout out to Tony. Now on to the small forward position. I forgot who the backup was, so we're going to remember this one together. Oh, Glenn Robinson III, that's right. He was good for Indiana. Um, he, with the starters, he actually had a positive net rating, which was a contrast to Monte Ellis, because Monte Ellis sucks, which I have to say in every video involving the Pacers at this point. Um, Monte had a good career, though. We'll give him that one. But we're going with Joe Ingles. I had to put him in here, okay? There was no way that I wasn't going to put the good version of Brian Scalabrini in this. Because, you know, Scalabrini was kind of a meme who would come in and have Michael Jordan-esque moments... But Joe Ingles is a legitimately good player who also looks like he shouldn't be in the NBA at all. What did he average? Like 10 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists, shot super well from 3. He's like a... I don't know, he's, he's like the dude at the YMCA who has no business being there, but he just does everything well. It's the best way to put it with Ingles. He's an awesome 3-point shooter, he's always making the right pass within Utah's offense. He's a good ball handler. I wouldn't want him to like run my offense consistently, but if he finds himself as the ball handler in a pick and roll, good things can come of it. And I know Utah re-signed him for like the next three or four seasons. He's definitely, I mean, he's nowhere close to Gordon Hayward, but at least it's nice to have a, a comparable, good enough small forward offensively. And he's also not bad defensively as well. So shout out to Joe Ingles. Power forward, we're going Jamichael Green on one single shot because I totally forgot to get footage of the guy in 2K. Shout out to Jamichael for his defense, three-point shooting, and athleticism. Actually, he was the backup. The starter is Jamal Johnson. That's not his name. It's James Johnson. He has been kind of a small forward or a power forward throughout his career, but he was mainly playing the four spot for Miami this season. And you could always see that Johnson had talent he had physical abilities he looked kind of scary because of his neck tattoo but he never really translated it into winning basketball but Miami won just making him lose weight because they are apparently masters at getting guys into shape Johnson showed to be way more athletic he had more stamina he was better defensively but what really made him maybe the best bench player in the NBA this season Sorry, Eric Gordon. Eh, maybe Eric Gordon still has it. Whatever. Was the ball handling and the passing ability for Johnson. He averaged over three assists a game. Was beating guys off the dribble somewhat regularly. And because he's a power forward, not every single opposing four actually has a chance of staying in front of him. And the defense was there. He also he managed to shoot like 34% from three, which isn't that great. But I guess it was good enough to where you couldn't just totally ignore the guy all the time. So for the season, what did he average? Like 10 points, 4 rebounds, 3.5 assists. Was good defensively. And he was a key member of Miami going on their crazy run where they turned up all the game sliders and nearly missed the playoffs. Or nearly, I don't know. I don't know the correct English. They missed the playoffs by a little bit. Which I'm thankful for as a Celtics fan because they terrified the hell out of me. Uh, so Johnson's good. He's going to be back in Miami, which I'm happy for. Hopefully he can just continue what he's doing. Uh, he deserved the contract that he got this offseason. Uh, the starting center is 
It's not Clint Capella. I keep messing up who the hell is in what order. He's the backup. He was great for Houston as the pick and roll roll man to uh, just kind of be one of the pieces in the James Harden has a great season wheel that Houston had going for him. The starting five, though, is Tristan Thompson. During all the Kyrie Irving trade stuff, one funny thing that came out was I guess there was this running joke within the Cavaliers organization that Kyrie Irving was the only guy who actually passed the ball to Tristan Thompson. Listen, man, you got to feed the big man, okay? And when you have a big man in Thompson who screens well, switches on to smaller guys well, defends the rim pretty well, is athletic, grabs a million offensive rebounds, and is just a constant nightmare for the opposing team, you got to give that guy the ball, man. Throw him an alley-oop or two. Remember Matthew Dellavedova? He would actually throw it to Tristan Thompson. The problem was they were always really bad passes. Uh, but anyway, Thompson's going to round out our centers. Your 2017 NBA role player all-stars will wait for 2018 for the next one.